Baruch, Ata, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melach, Haolam, Asher, Bachar, Banu, Miko, Haamim, Benasan, Lanu, S, Taraso, Baruch, Ata, Adonai, Nosein, Hatora, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. All right. So tonight we are continuing and concluding a topic that, to be honest, we started three weeks ago. Because we spoke three weeks ago about the topic of releasing pain. And we were supposed to finish it the next week. And then the next week I had like questions, which I love and I really appreciate getting. And they took the entire session. And then last week, it was the 24th of Teves. It was the passing of the Alter Rebbe, Admor Hazakain, the author of Tanya. And we dedicated the hour to him because I wanted everyone to have an opportunity to connect to his work and tap into the salvation energy of that day. It's a very, very powerful day. So I'm like, I want to give everyone the opportunity. So now we are doing part two of what we began three weeks ago. For anyone wondering, why are we now picking up on something that we did a while ago? So what are we talking about? We were talking about the idea of releasing pain. If you remember, I, I had had a situation with someone, a former student, and I had hurt her. And many years later, like this year, she came and spoke to me about it. And because she spoke to me about it, I was able to unknot the pain she was in over what I had done to her many years before. And I really was like, wow, imagine how many people are walking around with, with parcels and parcels of pain inside of them, you know, packages and packages of pain that nobody ever had the opportunity to unknot. So I wanted to give this class to help everyone. And also as a dedication for any students of mine out there that I might have hurt, I hope somehow just putting this in the air will just help them unknot their pain. So last time we spoke, I gave a number of ideas. I don't know if you remember. I mean, hopefully you remember because hopefully you've been thinking about it since. So I'm going to briefly review and maybe see if you have thought about it or done work on it. So the first idea was exactly what I did with this girl that I was very impressed. I say girl, no, this woman in her 30s that you know, she had the bravery and the courage to come to me and, and talk to me about it. That takes courage. But that's really the best thing to do if you can do that. If you know where that person is, if you can speak to them or if you could write them a letter. And if they're a safe person. Obviously, some people hurt, hurt us and they're not safe. So we are not going to go to them to tell them how they hurt us because they would just use it as an opportunity to hurt us more. So we're not talking about those people. But if but a safe, nice person could hurt because hurts come for lots of reasons. Hurts come from misunderstandings. Hurts come because miscommunication. Hurts come because everyone in different world has different <laughs> thoughts of what's going on. So like, you know, there's lots of different reasons why a completely nice person could hurt someone else. So you could be very nice. You could have still hurt someone. The person would be very nice and they could still get hurt. So if the person's nice and safe, the best thing, as we spoke about then three weeks ago, is to go to the person and to talk to them about it. And you can very explicitly say the reason why you're coming to them is because you really need them to apologize. And that would be very, very healing. And we said it might even be better to write than to talk because sometimes when you speak to someone, they can be like a little defensive. And therefore, that's not how I remember the story and like tell you all the things you did wrong and tell you, you know, which, which is probably true too, but not what you need to hear at all. 
when this girl came to me, I didn't say anything, but I'm so sorry. And you know, all that type of stuff. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give her my version of the story. She doesn't need that. That's not healing. She just needs to be told, I'm so sorry I hurt you. And that is the absolute truth because I am so sorry that I ever hurt anyone. I'm so sorry that because of me, someone's walking around with pain for so many years. So if someone comes to you, even though you do remember the story and you remember your part in the story and you remember your version of the story and you remember all the things that person did to you and that don't go anywhere near there because that's not the point. The point is to listen, to absorb the pain and to say, I'm really, really, really sorry. So has anyone ever experienced that? Has anyone ever come to them? I've experienced it three times. Has anyone ever come to them and, and spoken to them about things they have done to them that has been painful? Yes, but I didn't act correctly. Okay, that was very honest. You, you didn't yet have this class. So you um, did the knee-jerk human thing and you defended yourself. Not even defended myself, but I, it was in a way like, oh, no, 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 you misunderstood. It, I wasn't, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, you explained so I, your side of the story. Yeah, so I understand it now, what, what you're saying. But I, but I thought uh, um, the conversation was still helpful. Good. So how it turned out. Good. But, Good. But no, I, I'm no, glad. No, I appreciate no. your honesty. And I think what Rivka's saying is very human and very normal. Rivka's a very nice person. She was doing the very normal human thing. If someone comes to you and says, you know, you really hurt me when you blah, 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 blah. The most normal human thing of a very nice, normal person is to say, what? Are you rewriting history? <laughs> Do you remember what really happened? Should I remind you of like the five things you did before or the three things after, you know, look at the selective memory or, or, or in a much, obviously in a much nicer tone, cause you're such a nice person, but like, Oh, I'm sorry. I hurt you, but I was really just responding to what you had done to me five times over. That's normal. That's human. That's not lying. That's not distorting anything. But if someone comes to you, don't do that. But I'm glad that when Rivka did it, it still helped because it was still somewhat of a working through the issue. And, there, and the whole idea of working through it was to release it, which was the person's point. But when someone comes to you now, you're going to be superhuman and you're going to hold your tongue of anything you could say to defend yourself or say the correct version of the truth that this person obviously forgot. What is not, it is not... A lot of us get, get hung up on that idea of like, but the truth, the real truth, what really happened. And honestly, most of the time, the real truth is very irrelevant. It doesn't make a difference what the real truth is. What makes a difference is there's a hurt human being here. And we'd like to help that hurt human being heal. That's what makes a difference. The fact that she's misunderstanding and she's misremembering and actually she hurt me and actually I didn't do what she said I didn't actually she forgot what she did. All of that's very irrelevant. What's relevant is she's hurt and she's coming to me and I have an opportunity to help someone else heal. That's what's relevant. The truth is not so relevant. Anyone, so Rivka had that opportunity. I'm saying I had it three times. Anyone else here had that opportunity? That is surprising that I cannot remember anybody. But you can't maybe remember anyone ever confronting you. No, yeah, but that's the thing. People were too polite to say something. <laughs> yes. And and it's it's not so common. Because I think I think a person has to be really hurt and as you're saying, be a certain personality type to have the strength of character to go to you. It, it takes a lot of strength because when you're going to someone and you say, I was hurt, it makes you sort of vulnerable. Besides, some people don't want to talk about it. That's just even like, why would I go there? I just want to forget it and move on. But honestly, it's very, very, very healing especially if you go to a person who who really apologize very very sincerely and profusely 
It's very, very, very healing. So it's worth doing if the person that hurt you is a safe person. If they're not a safe person, don't try it. If they're a safe person, it is, it is, it is very worth doing. So that was the first thing we spoke about. You know, Sarah, I hit it, and I hit it with my son that he remembered something, and it was like completely not true. But I said, I I did say it this time. I I, I felt that he just wanted me to apologize, and I said I was sorry. I was. Good. <laughs> he said that was recent, or that was a long time ago. Uh, it was uh, just a few years ago, but Good. he said to me. Oh, you don't mean it. <laughs> no, 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 no. He just said that whatever. No, 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 no. You get full credit. You sensed he was called, he was, he was saying because he didn't apology, which is why he did say it. Yeah. You could have told him the truth of what happened that he uh, conveniently forgot. And you did not, which takes a lot of self-control. Because we want just, to defend our I just knew, I just knew that I, I just wanted to soothe him. You That's know? exactly the feeling. And, uh, and I kept telling, oh, I'm sorry, sweetheart. It wasn't like a big deal, but it it but it was just so silly. But I kept telling, but then he kept telling me, I don't think you mean it. And he said that afterwards or he said that during? After afterwards. Okay. But it's just his defense mechanisms kicking in. Don't worry, you did a good job. And it, and it takes a lot of self control to do that, especially when someone when someone confronts us and tells us that they you really hurt me when you did this, and we're like, what? What are you forgetting? We're just human. We want to defend ourselves. We want to say the truth. We want the truth to be known. We want to be logical and rational. And it, it, it took me a long, long time to realize this when I was dealing with emotional people, as most people in the world are very emotional, that emotional people don't really want the truth and they don't really want you to be logical and rational. That's not really why they're talking to you. So usually going in that direction, like doesn't really help. Logic, reason, <laughs> proof, <laughs> facts. <laughs> most of the time, those things are very, very non-relevant. And we're wasting our time with facts. Don't give facts. Just understand the emotion and deal with the emotion. That is what you need to do. Understand the emotion and forget about the facts. Now it's hard because if you're a factual person and you're being accused of being wrong and you were right, it's very hard to forget about the facts and just deal with the emotions. But that's actually what the person needs. So that's what you got to do. So I'm glad, Rifka, that you did it. All right. So that was the first thing we spoke about three weeks ago. Manucha, it's almost your birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Your birthday is the 4th of Shvat, if I remember correctly, which means this Thursday. Oh, this coming Thursday. Okay. Coming Thursday is your Jewish birthday. So it's nice you're on the class, the week of your Jewish birthday. If this was in person, Manucha would bring all this good food. But nobody wants to go in person, so we just have to wish her a happy birthday and not get any of her good food, but that's okay. We still want her to have a wonderful birthday. This is a week of her birthday, so we're really excited she's on the class and, and we're already tuning into all of her great birthday energies. So we are discussing, we said that three weeks ago we did Releasing Pain Part 1, and we never got to Part 2 because the next week we spent the hour answering questions, and then the week after that we spent the hour connecting to the Alta Rebbe on the anniversary of his passing to get all that salvation energy. So now we're up to part two. And what I first wanted to do was review what we had spoken about three weeks ago and sort of going a little deeper in it. So we did the first one, which was if you're in pain and the other person is safe, speak to them about it. And we're talking now more from our end. If someone comes to you, how to respond. That was the first thing. So the second thing that we spoke about was accepting and feeling the pain. So Rachel said that a lot of times, it's really surprising to her that actually people haven't come to ever complain to her or say to her. And a lot of people, when they're hurt, they think the strong thing to do, the better thing to do is like just bury it. And they don't realize that burying it is actually a very big cost 
because if you bury it, you're walking around with it for a long, long time. And it actually is, is a very big burden of all that buried emotion. And it's much healthier to accept it. It happened. And I accept that I felt this way because I'm human. I happen to still be human. So I felt this hurt. I felt this hurt. And move on. And move on. You, you have a choice to move on. You have a choice to move on to healthier, healthier patterns. Now, when we speak about that idea, and when I spoke about it three weeks ago, there's really two ways of looking at that idea, a more secular way and a more spiritual way. In other words, the in other words, a, 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 a totally not religious person could probably tell you that same idea. If you were hurt, accept the pain, understand it happened to you, and then move on and release it as versus pretending it didn't happen and then burying it and that's so unhealthy. You don't have to be a, a, a godly person to understand that. But if you are a godly person, you can understand it on a very different level. And the level we understand it on as wannabe godly people, as people that are striving for a relationship with God, as many of you have been on this class for like uh, 10 years now, so we're definitely all people that are really striving to come closer and closer to God. So we understand the God peace in that statement. Meaning as a more secular minded person, I could say, oh, I got hurt in this way. And guess what? It's true. And I'm a different person because of it. I am a different person because of it. And that's who I am and that's my life. And I'm not gonna pretend that's not me. It is me and I can accept it's me. And I'm gonna live knowing that, yeah, maybe I'm not as I had originally scripted because I didn't script my life to be the way it became, but it is what happened. And I have to accept that is my life and accept me for who I am now as a person who's gone through these issues. You could take that same concept and if you think of it from a spiritual perspective, then you bring in God. Then you bring in the term called hashkacha practice. This is all divine providence, exactly what God wants. If you know more deep Hasidic Kabbalistic concepts, you bring in the idea that we call achdut Hashem, which means it's only God and there is only God and there's nothing but God, which means that everything that happens to a person is happening because God wanted it to happen because if God didn't want it to happen it wouldn't happen like a you know, simple concept you're a klutzy person you're clumsy and you're walking and you trip and spill something oh me the klutz maybe but the point is God wanted it to spill because if God didn't want it to spill it wouldn't have spilled I, I'm abnegating responsibility I'm understanding that God runs the world, every detail in the world. It's his world. I'm a classy person, but I spill this because God wanted me to spill. It. So that's true for every little spill. It's also true for everything we go through in our life. So as a spiritual person, as a God oriented person, if something's happened to me, I can look at it and say, you know, God, you're in this. You're part of it. You made it happen. You made me lose that job. It's your script, different than mine. You made me be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was you, you orchestrate everything. So of course I can accept what happened to me. I know it's coming from you. And even though I could say wrong place, wrong time, by you, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing bad. You're only good. So my wrong place, right time, wrong time was your version of what's good for me. And I can accept it as such. And my losing my health or my job or this problem in my marriage or this problem with my child, I'm looking at it as things I have to accept that are painful, but I have to accept them instead of pretending they didn't happen. But if I think more godly, I recognize you're part of the picture. It happened, the issue in the, the, the child or the marriage or the finances or the health or anything else in the world is happening because you love me and you know what's best for me. And this is your version of best. 
So of course I can accept it. It's you and it's your version of the word best. So my question to you is, has anyone here experienced something which they first processed in a more, I'm using the word secular, in a more secular way, meaning like, okay, it happened, so I better accept it instead of pretending it didn't happen, because that's even worse. And then over the years of learning, because again, some of you have been learning here 10 years, re-looked at what happened to you and was able to come to a much deeper acceptance because you realize it's all God, it's all Hashem. And this is actually what he wants and he loves you. And he only wants what's good for you. So this actually is good. And that's how you can accept it. Did anyone here ever do that work? Like looking at something that happened and then looking at it deeper with more spiritual godly eyes to really accept it because they really understood it was from him? I have a different experience. So um, yesterday I was shoveling the snow and I pulled my back muscle. So, and I told myself for some reason, Hashem wants me to be in this condition, to be in pain. And the same happened last time, last year when I was shoveling the snow. I don't know why. I know that Hashem wants me to, to be injured and be like at this moment. And, but I, I don't have any spiritual explanation for that. No, you don't necessarily have a spiritual explanation. You did it perfect, Manucha. That was like an A1 example. That was a perfect example. That was exactly what I was asking, except I was, but I was at maybe three years before that, you shoveled the snow and hurt yourself. And you're just like, oh, I know I should get my husband to do this. <laughs> I was doing this. It's hard work. I can think this for a woman, this work. Shoveling. Yeah. It's hard man's work. Exactly. That's why sometimes women have to do it because the men say it's hard. I know, I know, but. Or you have a house like mine, it just doesn't get shoveled because it's hard work. <laughs> Probably not the good answer. But I no, Manucha, what you're saying is really a beautiful way of, of, of responding. It doesn't mean, I'm glad Manucha raised that question because maybe I wasn't clear. It doesn't mean that we necessarily have the answer to the unspoken question, the perpetual question, why? Are we ever privy to that answer? Sometimes, at least we think we got the answer because sometimes with hindsight, but this already happened to Manucha two years in a row, <laughs> maybe God's telling you what Bella's saying. <laughs> um, sometimes things happen and we realize, oh, that's why. You know, like the simple examples, like I, I lost my job because God wanted me to get out of that toxic environment, or I lost my job because God wanted to give me a better one with better conditions, nicer people, better pay, easier work, closer to home. There's a million reasons why I, God in his kindness had me lose my job. Like sometimes we can see that. You know, there's many, many stories that happen to people that we can like understand how like, Oh, that bad thing was so good. And Hashem was being so kind. Of course, we didn't realize at the time. But that's not what I mean by accepting. Accepting doesn't mean once you figured out the secret divine plan. Accepting means you say, it's God. It's God. That's what Michael's saying. God wanted me to hurt myself. She's exactly right. Why? I don't know. God wants me to hurt herself. We could speculate, but why bother? You know, <laughs> who knows where our speculation is going to go? It's besides the obvious, God's telling you you shouldn't shovel the snow. <laughs> but what, what, why? That's not what acceptance means. Acceptance means it's God. And when I accept it as God, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it might physically hurt because it's her, her, her back or her shoulder, but it doesn't emotionally hurt because I know God loves me and can do anything and is choosing to do this so if god has absolute love for me can do anything and is doing this 
that's what's the best for me at this moment today maybe tomorrow will be different but today this is the right thing for me so it releases we're talking about releasing pain it releases the pain i don't understand the divine plan but it releases the pain i have over that like so much in life is not what happened that gives us pain it's our perspective on what happened that gives us pain if so some, I'm, for example, I'm interrupting. Bella, no, keep going. If something um, could happen, uh, I don't like or some something. I was thanking God that it happened like that, not not worse. Good, good. That's definitely bringing God in. That's very good. Not if something would have happened, I thank God that it happened like that, not worse. And, that, and that's a great way of acceptance. This happened and I know God's involved and I'm grateful to God because it, I could see how it could be so much worse. And that gratitude helps me accept it. We're talking about acceptance. And we're talking about acceptance because when you have that acceptance, you don't have the pain. As I'm saying, pain a lot of time comes from perspective. So... It could have been so much worse. God, I know you were there in it because you protected me from it being worse. Why it happened, I still don't know. Like Menuch on her shoulder and I don't know. Maybe when Mashiach comes. But for now, I feel your kindness and compassion in making it less than it could have been. And therefore, and therefore you can accept it. So yeah, Bella, that's great. That's the point. You're bringing God in. And because you're bringing God in, you're accepting it. And again, you could have in a more, as I called it, secular perspective, accepted something without bringing God in. The acceptance is like, let's take Manuha's example. Okay, it happened. I'm going to go around feeling bad about it. It happened. Move on. That's true. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. And that's healthy. But when you bring God in, it's so much deeper. It's so much more healing. When it's not like, well, it happened and I can either walk around upset, except probably at my husband, or upset at myself, you know, or upset at the snow, or upset that I live in Chicago, you know, or upset, upset at the, 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 the Lincoln Woods ways, how they clean the sidewalk, you know, I can be upset at, I can upset at everything. So instead of being all upset, I'm just like, it happened and I'm not going to get upset over it. It happened. It's something else in my life. Next time someone has a shoulder injury, I'll be able to empathize more deeply because I experienced it too. Move on. That's great. That's good work. That's healthy. But when you bring in God and say, oh, God, you wanted me to hurt my shoulder. All right. I know you love me. So then you just release the pain on a, on a much, much, much deeper level. Anyone else? Anyone else has done this? Anyone else has seen this experience of like the two different ways of accepting? Okay. So then we spoke about a third idea in terms of releasing the pain, which was actually by like reliving the experience and like going into it a bit and remembering it, but remembering it and giving yourself, because a lot of times when we're hurt, like we sort of get stuck in that space and we don't move on, not when you hurt your shoulder, but like deeper hurts and like sort of reliving it and giving yourself the message, but now we're okay. But now I'm safe. It's not 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. I'm safe. I'm in Chicago. Nobody's hurting me. And that's that's actually a deep way to relive the pain. Though, as I said, when we discussed it, like Rabbi Akiva's rock, hopefully you remember that metaphor of the drops and the drops and the drops. Sometimes a technique like this, you have to do many, many times to like get through all the layers there. The fourth thing we spoke about was turning to God and asking him to help you. Because sometimes we have a hurt inside of us and it's, it's too big for us. Sometimes it's just too big for us and we really, we really don't have the tools to handle it. It's really, really bigger than what we can handle. But we, we want to release this pain, but we don't have the ability. And what we really sometimes need to do is just give it over to God that I should know he's with me, that I should feel safe, that I should feel secure, 
that I should know I'm not hurt. I should not feel I'm being hurt. And the more I can like feel that I gave this over to God, the less I feel pain over it. The fifth thing we spoke about, and this we spoke about a lot, was forgiveness as a tool for releasing pain. And we spoke a lot about this idea that you could forgive selflessly, because if somebody hurt you and you don't forgive them, they're going to suffer. And you could also forgive selfishly. You're not so worried about them and their suffering, to be honest, but you know, until you forgive them, you're walking around with this. You're, you're stuck with it. And this was the last thought that we spoke about. We spoke about this for a while. And we spoke about different techniques that you could use to, to forgive. Because I think we all understood that forgiveness is a great strategy. And if we forgive someone, we're really not gonna be stuck in pain, but that sometimes it's hard to forgive. And how do we forgive? And um, um, we spoke about the idea of compassion as a tool of forgiveness, that if you really feel bad for the other person, it's easier to forgive them. We spoke about um, the idea that um, looking at the person as a total person and saying, even though they, you know, like a simple example, even though my mother really didn't understand me, but she was really trying hard to be a good mother. She just didn't get me at all. So sometimes when we take a person and we put them, we see the total person and the total perspective, like a lot of times we get stuck. Oh, she never understood me. She was never there for me. She didn't understand me. She didn't appreciate me. We get so stuck in that true place. But if we sort of step back and see the whole person, you know, she really did love me. She really tried hard. She did the best she could. She just didn't know, understand me very well. It's easier to forgive a person when you see the whole person. I think Russell said something like that when we spoke. I think Russell, you brought out that idea of like, sometimes if someone hurts you, you can look and say, oh, but they have all these other good qualities. And you said, when you think of their other good qualities, then it's easier to forgive them. They're not a horrible person. They might not be good in a certain area, but in other areas, you can see they're a good person. And when you see that about a person, that they're a good person, it's easier to forgive. Um, so since we spoke, and it was three weeks ago, has anyone been using these techniques? Has anyone maybe not had the situation, but but did anyone have a situation where they were able to forgive someone since we spoke about this idea of forgiving? I didn't have the experience uh, right now, but I have a question. Let's say uh, you have um, a close friendship and um, you forgive, you forgive the person, but you don't want to resume the closeness. How, how is that? How? That could be okay. Um, Miriam mentioned that. I remember when we discussed this, this was, Miriam phrased it like this. She said, she's not on tonight. I, I know she told me she's coming on maybe a little late. Miriam yeah. said, I can forgive, but I can't forget. That's how Miriam expressed it. It was very strong how she said it. And it depends on the situation. Sometimes you, you shouldn't forget because you need to protect yourself in that situation. Like if you had a close friend and she, you told her something private and then she only shared it with four people that shared it with four people. And by two days later, the whole city's talking about you, but you forgave her. You knew she was doing the best she could with the tools she had. And you knew she doesn't have very good tools in this area. And you forgave her because you don't want to carry it in your heart. But you're never going to tell her anything private. That's fine. That's actually probably a very good judgment call in that situation. So sometimes if someone hurts us and we say, I forgive them, but I learned something about them that I'm going to remember and be wary of in the future, that's not wrong. It's not wrong to have healthy boundaries and to understand certain people are good for certain situations and they're not good for other situations. So I'm not going to 
put her at risk of failing again. Like, why should I give her that challenge? So I think that's fine. As long as it doesn't, as long as you really forgave the person to remember it and therefore I'm saying maybe be more cautious in the future because of it, I don't think is a problem. If that's what you meant, if something along those lines. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, but I'm glad you were able to forgive. Do you, do you know what tool you used? Remember how you got yourself to forgive? Time. Time. Time is a, time is a very good tool. Time, we say, is a great healer. And it is a very good tool to forgive. So that what, what Rivka is saying is actually a very good point, a very practical point that if someone hurt you and you're like, okay, I know I need to forgive them. I know if I forgive them, then I'll release my pain and I got to get over this pain. So I've got to forgive them, but I can't. And you try to have compassion for them and it doesn't work. And you try to think of their good qualities and it doesn't work. And you try any of the other tips we say and it doesn't work. Remember what Rivka said put it aside and come back to it a few weeks later. And sometimes you have to do that a few times. But time, as we say in English, is a great, and they probably have an expression like that in Russian also, time is a great healer. And when we look at things with more time and more time and more time, you know what? It happened, we all moved on, we all survived, we're different people. And we don't want to hold it in our heart. So time, so time is a very good technique to use if you're struggling to forgive someone and, you, and you're not succeeding. Did anyone else? R Russell? Is it the correct thing to do if something like that happens and you feel like for some reason, like this person is on a different plan of, planet of understanding. Maybe somebody hurts you without even noticing. Is it correct to try to distance yourself from this person? The distancing would be correct if you feel they could do the same thing in the future. If you're saying they're on a different planet, which means let's say they constantly throw out hurtful sayings to you. Now we're not talking about your mother or your father or your child or your husband. We're not talking about a person like that. Those type of people that you need to work through the relationship. But you're talking about a colleague, a friend, a neighbor, a person in school, some such person in your world who manages to hurt you without really meaning to or wanting to. It's just like they're on a different planet. Right. So yeah, it's fine to, I mean, not in a rude, overt way that you're like trying to give them the cold shoulder so they should realize what they did wrong, but in a more subtle way, I think that's exactly the point Rifka was making. If you're saying this person without meaning to manages to hurt me a lot, and they're not mandatory for my world, they're not my child, they're not my parent, they're not my spouse, they're not someone in my inner circle that is in my world, so we've got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. then it's perhaps a very healthy technique to distance yourself. I don't think it's wrong at all. As long as you, on the surface, act nicely to the person, I think it's totally fine to distance yourself because it's protection and it's healthy boundaries. And sometimes we need those healthy boundaries. <laughs> yeah, of course. Now, sometimes... Sometimes if someone's hurting us and we can't forgive or hurting or hurt and we can't forgive, we, 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 we don't have the inner resources to forgive. We're not strong enough. We're not holy enough. We just can't do it. Sometimes it's good. I don't know if we touched on this last time, but it's good to detach from the person, which is sort of what Russell's saying, but I'm saying not detach in the future to protect yourself, but to detach because you're not ready to forgive, but you can at least detach from the situation. Um, you know, like sometimes, like, I mean like a more deep hurt, like let's say, I don't know, I'm just making up an example to try to explain my point. Let's say somebody was hurt by one of their parents when they were a child, you know, their parent, maybe their parent, 
had their own issues going on and the parent did things that really hurt the child. So as this child grew up, she doesn't find it in her heart to forgive her mother. She just, she, she should, she knows she should. She just doesn't find it in her heart to forgive her mother. And she still has a lot of pain in her heart from what her mother did to her. If she can't forgive, detaching is pretty healthy. Detaching means you're just not gonna feel. <laughs> But sometimes, you know, going along the lines of what Rivka was saying about time as the great healer and time and also something else is growth. The Rivka didn't credit herself with growth. She just credited herself with time. But I'm going to also throw in the idea of growth that as people, we grow every single day. We grow up or we grow down. But none of us are stationary. It, it, our, our sages say that in the Talmud, man is called a walker, a mover. Angels, angels are called stationary. They're created beings like a robot, like a computer, like a model. And as they, a mannequin, as they are, they are. They're never going to grow higher. They're never going to fall lower unless God does something to make them fall lower. Otherwise, they are just stationary forever. Forever, literally, for infinity. Human beings, conversely, don't stay still for one minute. We're always in flux. We're always going up or down or up or down or up or down all day long, every single distance, every minute of our life. So besides time being a great healer, you're growing. Either you're growing down or you're growing up but we're all always growing. So it's possible that at a certain point in your life, you couldn't find it in your heart to forgive the person. And over time, that gave you a certain perspective and you also grew and now you can. So similarly, like sort of now connecting this to what Rachel's saying, if someone hurt you in a way that you just felt I have to detach myself, I, if they're not a safe person for me to be around, and that's what I'm going to do to be safe, to be healthy, which also what Rifka was mentioning. You could do that. And then as time goes on and as you get stronger and more skilled and grow more and more and more, you could revisit that relationship and forgive them. Maybe you can't do it today. Maybe you can't do it in six months from now. But it's possible that as time continues because of time and because of your growth, and if only also because of their growth, that you, you actually can revisit the relationship and now you really can come to a deeper place and you can really forgive. Anyone else had an experience recently that they remember forgiving a person and they remember what tool they use to forgive? Because I think it's something so common in all of our experiences. So it's really good to share other people's tips. Um, hi, this is Chava. Hi, Chava. Um, I use compassion. That's that's my tool that tool. I always try. Yeah, that's what I always try to use um, to find, to try to see what the person in what kind of situation the person is and. Um, what challenges that person has and something going on, whatever. So, um, so I'm kind of creating in my head uh, and uh, then I become compassionate and uh, it's like really make. I think that's actually the small. best, the best, the best. I actually, oh, now you said something else. I was waiting for someone to say. Chava said compassion, and I was just interrupting her and saying that I agree, and I think compassion is, is my go-to. I think it's the best tool of all. It's what the Alter Rebbe speaks about in Tanya, but she also now mentioned another very good tool. Chava, do you know what you just said? You said you have compassion until what happens? Um, that uh, that uh, mm. What happens to the pain? What did you say happens? Smaller, it becomes smaller. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That is another tool. Another tool for forgiveness. And it's a very practical tool. And I agree with everything Hava said, because I, I, my go-to is compassion. But something else that Hava's connected to compassion, and sometimes you can use it separately, 
is just to diminish the situation, diminish the pain, like really look at it. And then you like, sometimes things grow and grow and grow and grow in our eyes. Like the situation grows and grows and what happened grows and grows. Or sometimes it was a really big situation. That's why it's very big. And the pain is a really big pain. And that's why it's really very big. And sometimes we consciously can just work to just make it smaller, put it in perspective. You can sometimes diminish it by just saying, will I remember in three years what this person did? And maybe you'll say, yeah, I really would. And they just say, no, I don't think so. You know, it, different lines like that to just like, as you can diminish the pain by diminishing the event, that is a very good way to come to forgiveness. Because when it's so big in our eyes and the pain is so deep and so strong, it's really hard to forgive. And when we can figure out a way to make it smaller, like I was saying directly by compassion, which of course is an amazing tool. But in the end of the day, if compassion doesn't work for you or in this situation, compassion doesn't work, just try to think of another way of like rephrasing the situation to like shrink it because that really helps us forgive. Anyone else, anything else anyone uses to help forgive? I tried compassion once, but then I felt like to have compassion, I'm looking for something not very good in a person's life to be sorry for, for, <laughs> sorry for them. <laughs> so I was like, I, I think better for me worked finding good things in the person. Which is what you told us which is yeah. what you said, which really does work and people really do it. And honestly, what I think is a lot of times there's not one thing that's the ultimate best thing that you always can use. Like you're saying compassion. Well, I couldn't find anything to be compassionate about. She's got a great life. I mean, I think, I mean, what do I know? She always seems happy. She's successful. She's got a seemingly a good marriage, lots of kids, beautiful home. I don't really have much compassion for her. You should only know her life. You have compassion, but I don't. So I don't, I don't have a very good imagination. What can I tell you? Some people have an easier time just extrapolating and envisioning. I, I actually agree with Chava. Personally, I always go to compassion as like my best tool because I look at it sort of like, like if somebody was hurtful to me, I mean, deliberately, not like, you know, accidentally. They were deliberately being like abusive, being, you know, very hurtful. I think, I don't know, need to know anything about their story. I think for you to treat someone else like this, you must be in a lot of pain. That's true. That's it. I have compassion because only someone in a lot of pain would want to cause pain to others. You right. said that to cause me pain. You said that to hurt me. You succeeded. You did a good job. So if, if you were trying to be so hurtful, I know nothing about your life, but I can imagine that you must be in a lot of pain because only people in pain try to hurt other people. So that's, that's my general, for people I don't know anything about specifically, how I could have compassion for a person. I don't need to know their life. I'm not looking to know their life. But that is like an extreme situation. That's a situation when someone is being hurtful to me deliberately. Yeah. Now, obviously, if someone hurt, if someone's a was a really nice, sweet person and they accidentally hurt you, it shouldn't be so hard to forgive them. It's more when someone's being like mean and deliberately mean that maybe it's harder for you. And that's what you can tell yourself. But if they were so rude, if they were mean, if they were said something so nasty, if they did something so nasty, if they mm -hmm. deliberately did something to hurt me or to hurt my children, then they must be in a lot of pain. Now, sometimes I, if I know the person, then I could sort of more extrapolate their pain and I know that they're going through and then I'm like, really can feel compassion. But if I don't know, I say that to myself and a lot of times it, it, it engenders compassion because they must be hurting to hurt me like that or to try to hurt me like that. that, that that's my general assumption. You know, or even if they're not hurting, no, they're actually quite happy in their life. Something must be really off in their background, in their history to be happy doing that. I feel bad for them for that also. 
But you can feel bad compassion, what relationships they have. This is how they treat people. What kind of relationships must they have in their life if this is how they treat people? So that could also work. I don't know. I, I do agree with Chava. I, I do feel compassion is good. Something else that sometimes also works because compassion isn't always going to work. It also depends how you're wired, what works for you. What I know some people have told me over time is when they think of, now this, you might need to be a certain type of person to do it. So it might not work for you. But when they think of what they've gained from the situation, they can forgive the person. Meaning someone did something to hurt you. Someone bad mouth you and you lost your job or whatever. You know, half of your friends stopped talking to you. And at this point in time, you're like, that was very painful. It was very hurtful. They deliberately did that. They made up a lie about me. But you know what? I became a much stronger person because of that. I actually found out who my real friends are <laughs> through, through their, with, their, with, their, with their help. Or I became a much more understanding person and I became a much more sensitive person. Or I'm so sensitive to gossip because I see how I got hurt by gossip or, you know, whatever else. I'm just making this stuff up. So, you know. If I think of what I gained from their, their hurt, it's easier for me to forgive them because I actually really gained from that situation. They didn't do it for my benefit, but I truly gained. And I'm glad I gained. And I'm glad I'm so sensitive to gossip because I was gossiped about. I'm glad I'm so sensitive to honesty because someone said a lie about me. I'm glad I have more of an appreciation for a real friend because this person caused all my fake friends to leave me, you know, whatever. So I can forgive them if I can look at the situation in the perspective of there really was a lot of gain, not the gain I was looking for, not the gain they were looking for. That's actually what we see from Yosef, from Joseph and his brothers, that when Joseph, you know, his brothers didn't treat him so nicely. And years later, when they were in his hands, he, in the end, of course, treated them very nicely and he took their, all their families in and he supported them in Egypt. And they said to him, they said, Joseph, we were so mean to you. How can you be so nice to us? And this, this is, that was his answer. His, I, mean, I mean, his answer wasn't exactly that. I'm putting it in my words. But his answer was, well, let's say someone meant to give you a, a cup of poison, but gave you a cup of the best wine. He gave you the best wine. You should have to thank him for that. You might argue the case if he wants to give you poison, but whatever. This is what Joseph said. So similarly, you meant to do bad, but it was all God. It was all good. You didn't really do bad. You really helped me and helped the whole Jewish people. So I should be upset at you. Even if you meant bad, what happened was good. So similarly in our own lives. Now, again, you have to be a certain type of person to do this. And obviously it doesn't apply for every situation. And it doesn't apply for every hurt. But it's just another thing in your toolbox. Besides Rachel's idea of looking at the total person and seeing they're a better person than you're feeling when you're thinking about how they hurt you. Besides what Chava was saying and I about compassion and about trying to just in your mind diminish what happened. Would I remember this in five years? Would I remember this in two years? Am I going to remember this in three months? Besides what Rifka is saying about time and I threw in growth, something else is to really say, did I grow from this situation? Remember, it's all God and it's all good. God wanted this to happen. This person made a bad choice. That's true. But God wanted it to happen and God wanted to happen for my good. And I actually see how it was good for me. It didn't feel good at the time, but I'm a better person today because of it. If I really get that I'm a better person today because of it, it shouldn't be so hard to forgive the person. They help make me a better person. It's a it's a interesting way of reframing what happens in our life. It's a true way. Joseph is a good person to rely on, and it um and it's it's another way of of helping come to the idea of forgiveness because we do want to forgive, and forgiveness is a huge, huge, huge tool to um to release pain sure um quick question quick question um would 
uh, another big reason for forgive, I mean, forgiving is good in our current life. Uh, somebody talked to me about it. That's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, what about forgiving in this life? So you don't have to come back in another life to resolve this. Uh, yes, uh, people, people, people can people can bring that in also if that works for you. I wouldn't bring that in now though because in my head, Michelle's coming, so I'm not looking at another life. But a hundred years ago, I would have agreed with you. It's interesting what Rifka's saying in the prayers, in the prayer book, in the Siddur, we pray in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, and then like for extra measure, extra points. There's prayers we say before we go to sleep. So of course people say, you, I mean, people know you say Shema. Shema is three paragraphs. If you look in the Siddur, the prayers before we go to sleep is like five pages. Because there's a bunch of other prayers we say at the same time in connection to going to sleep and like your final nightly rituals. And the first paragraph of the, just before we say Shema, the first paragraph we say is, I forgive anyone who hurt me in this lifetime or in any previous lifetime, which is a very powerful concept that sort of wrote this, I will hold on because it's talking about the past, not the future. And this is what Rift was saying. It is possible people now are suffering for ways they hurt you in a previous lifetime. There's, there's a person I know, I'll tell you, uh, I can tell you so much about the story, so it might not be so powerful. But there was is a man I know. He's very strong, whatever. Go-getter, dynamic individual. And when he was a bar mitzvah boy, someone did something to really hurt and ruin his bar mitzvah. An adult did something that really, really ruined his bar mitzvah. And he said, I'm never going to forgive that person. His mother also said that. <laughs> She's never going to forgive that person. Um, now, that person happened to, in totally separate situation, also hurt me very much in a totally different way. The person passed away. Now, me being me, when the person passed away, I right away said to God, I forgive this person completely. I forgive them completely. I forgive them completely. I don't want anyone suffering up there because of me. Separately, my husband didn't tell me this at the time, but separately, my husband, who was also hurt by the person, said the same thing. I forgive him completely. I forgive him completely. I forgive him completely. I don't want anyone hurt because of him. This man and his mother said, I still don't forgive him. I don't care. I don't forgive him. Update. Now, this was when he was a child. He's an adult now with children himself. Update to um, very recently this year. This man, I'm sorry, I'm not saying any names. I'm not giving too many details. So it's not such an interesting story. It's a very interesting story. If you know the details, but I'm not sharing them. This man, we'll call him Schmo. This man, Mr. Schmo, he was speaking to someone else, Mr. Joe, who just went through a crazy, tragic situation in his life. And Mr. Schlob, A, said to, to this guy, Joe, he said, Joe, you know why that happened to you? Because, because of what you did, how you hurt someone else very badly, and you never apologized, you never, you, never asked, you never asked for forgiveness. And he was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to ask for forgiveness, and I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. He said, but look what just happened to you. Look at the tragedy that just happened to you. Such a tragedy happened to you. Don't you think there's a connection between you hurting this person and that tragedy? Don't you think you should ask for forgiveness because of the tragedy you're currently experiencing? So the person was like, maybe he like sort of got it a bit. So this guy said to me, he said, you know what? There's a person who I've never forgiven. He destroyed my bar mitzvah. I said, I'm never going to forgive him. He passed away. I didn't forgive him. If you go ask this person for forgiveness, I'm going to forgive this person. I'm going to forgive him because if you can ask this person for forgiveness, I can forgive this person. And that's what happened. Which would be a stronger story if you knew more details, but it's still a very powerful point. Forgiveness is a very huge thing and it haunts us through lifetimes. 
And that's why the first paragraph of the prayers we say when we go to sleep is I forgive. Now you can say, well, that's an easy thing to say. You don't know what happened to you in a previous lifetime, but it happened to you. If you're saying now, I forgive anyone who hurt me in a previous lifetime, that means someone hurt you deeply enough that they're still suffering now. And it was a previous lifetime and they're still suffering. Maybe in the afterlife, maybe they were reincarnated and they're suffering, but they're still suffering because they hurt you. And that also gives you a perspective on forgiveness. It's the only thing we say like that. It's the only thing we say like that. There's nothing else. I mean, these are prayers. These are not Kabbalistic, you know, whatevers. We never in our prayers mention my previous lifetimes. We never talk about them. I mean, we live in the present. Now, this is my lifetime. I don't remember any previous lifetimes, though we all know we have previous lifetimes. And I deal with the present. I deal with this reality. I deal with today. The fact that this is built into our prayers, that every single day besides Sabbath or a holiday, we literally every single day say, if we say this prayer, I forgive anyone who hurt me in this lifetime or in any previous lifetime. One thing for sure you understand from this, how incredibly important it is to forgive. It's so important that we forgive people from previous lifetimes. And it just makes it so strong because if we don't forgive them until we really forgive them, how can I forgive someone I don't know? You understood you got hurt. You understood someone hurt you. And, and guess what? You've been saying this prayer your whole life and you still are saying because maybe someone's still suffering because you never really meant it yet. To really mean it. Because that really shows you the power of forgiveness and how absolutely important forgiveness is. And how literally it goes from lifetime to lifetime until someone forgives. Chava, you were going to say something before. Um, yes. Um, and that's a thought about, I think it's similar to what you've been saying before. But um, I look at, sometimes I look at it as this is test for me that Hashem gives me this situation so I can work on my character and refinement of my character. And this is a test. And uh, when I look at it, that it's, uh, it's a test, um, then again, it helps me to, um, and also, I don't know, it's the same or similar. Sometimes I think that's my ego, why I feel so hurt by the situation. Maybe that's because I have such a big ego. And uh, if I like stop looking at like um, feeding my ego, then I wouldn't feel that hurt from the situation. So those couple of things also I use. Very powerful, especially I think the idea of a test, because sometimes mm -hmm. in general, when you think like that, oh, this is a test, then right away, your ego <laughs> says, I don't want to fail. I know it's a, I, I see the cop right there. I'm going to come to a complete stop. Come on. I see the cop. I know this is a test. And I'm going to fail. So it is a great, I didn't say this at all. It's a great technique. I, I, I think it's amazing to reframe the fact of your struggling to forgive the person as like, this is probably a test from God. And I don't want to fail the test. And I think what Chava said also, which I also never thought of and I never heard anyone say it before, but I think it's also a great idea is maybe this is my ego trip. I can't forgive. I was so hurt. And maybe I, I God in his kindness has given me an opportunity to get out of my ego. I once had a very intense experience with this. I, I don't know if I ever shared it. If I had, it would have been on something on forgiveness. I don't remember if I did or not. Um, it was Rosh Hashanah and I was walking, not this year, last year. So it was a year and a half ago, Rosh Hashanah. I was walking to Tashlich when you walk to make the blessing, the prayer by the water on Rosh Hashanah. And there was a whole bunch of factors that came together that caused me to notice two people that I never, ever see. 
also, obviously, they were walking back from the water and from the prayer, and I was walking to the water and the prayer. I was walking in a direction I wouldn't normally be walking. Until that moment, I had actually been looking down because I was saying Psalms. I was saying to Hillim, I'm Rosh Hashanah. I say to Hillim as I walk the whole day. Something had happened, so I, I wasn't able to say the Tehillim then. So I was looking straight up. And therefore, I saw these people that I otherwise wouldn't have seen because I've been looking down the whole time, saying the prayers, saying the Tehillim, saying the Psalms. So I saw these two people and they had both hurt me very, very, very significantly. And the hurt, I mean, what they, the damage they did to me still continues. So it was a very significant damage, very significant hurt. And I saw them and I never see them. I mean, they don't live anywhere near me, but I mean, they both, obviously they had walked not where they normally live to go to the water. And I had walked where I would never normally be to go to the water. So that's where we both were in this place. We wouldn't normally be. And it wasn't really the popular time to go. I was going straight from synagogue, whatever. And I understood this is just the hand of God, that I happened to see them, that I was actually looking up and not looking at my prayers, that we crossed paths at the same time, that I wasn't as I was five minutes before with my husband, where I for sure wouldn't have noticed, or with my children. I mean, the whole thing was like, literally God plotted the whole thing for me to see them on Rosh Hashanah. And I'm like, why am I seeing them? I never see them. And why am I seeing them on Rosh Hashanah? And I said, the only thing I could think of is God's telling me I need to forgive them. And I was like, this is it. I, God wants me to forgive them. It's Rosh Hashanah and they're being judged and they caused me very serious harm. And God wants me to forgive them. And it was, it was hard. It was hard. It was hard. I'm human. It was hard. But I just kept going back. That's what I'm thinking what Chava said about the test that reminded me of this, that I felt like God wants me to forgive them. It's Rosh Hashanah and they're Jews and, you know, they need to be forgiven. Otherwise they're going, they could, you know, they did really harm to me and I have to really, really forgive them. And it's very hard. And I really, really worked on myself because it's Rosh Hashanah and, and I need to forgive them. And I worked and I, I forgave them. I said, I forgave them. I worked till I, I worked, I worked. It took me a while. I had to work till I was able to really forgive them. So sometimes it's, it's like, that could be viewed as a test. I didn't think of it that way. It could be, that was my test at Rosh Hashanah, but it also could be that sometimes you need to forgive the person because they need to be forgiven because, because, because people will really, because if people really hurt you, they're going to really suffer. And even though they really hurt us, I mean, this is how I feel. I don't want to be the cause of anyone else suffering. You know, I, I'm not looking to be the cause of someone else's suffering, even though they really hurt. So can I ask a question? But also an idea that it was God's decree, so you get hurt. He, God chooses the person, is it correct? Well, no, what we would say there is... What we would say there is... God chooses that you should get hurt, but the tool God's using is a tool appropriate for that. It doesn't take away a person's free choice. Meaning people, God plans, but people also freely choose. So somehow it would have worked that if God planned for me to get hurt in this specific fashion, and I've thought about that, you know, in my own head, if God wanted this to happen to me and they hadn't chosen to do what they did, it would have happened to me, but in a different fashion without them causing that, the damage. The damage could happen without a human being causing the damage. God's very capable. If, if someone's supposed to just a simple thing, if someone sticks out his leg for you to trip and fall on your face, if nobody's going to stick out their leg, you'll just trip and fall on your face. If you're supposed to fall, you're going to fall. But people are making choices. Now, when we forgive someone, what we're saying, Menuch, is what you said. This is, that is actually a tool of forgiveness. That's written in Tanya. That's what the Alter Rebbe says about forgiveness is to understand, to understand that everything that happens is supposed to happen. And therefore, whatever anyone does to me is part of God's plan. And since God's plan is good, even if in my eyes it looks bad, it's part of God's goodness, which is what we were saying before about releasing pain. So if this person robbed me, they robbed me and I lost something very valuable. Let's just say, someone robbed me and I lost something very valuable. 
and I'm really upset and I lost this very valuable item. You know, they stole it and I can't get it back. They destroyed it. Someone went into my house and vandalized my house and destroyed something. So how do I forgive? So what you're saying, which is true, which is what the author Rebbe writes in Tanya is, because this is what God wanted. Well, this person made it, this person freely chose. That's true. That's, in other words, there are two concurrent truths. It is true that this person freely chose and they chose poorly and they will get punished for their bad choice probably. That's a separate issue. But for me, as the recipient of the vandalization, that's what God wanted for me. And God's only good. And he only wanted it for my good. And therefore this person actually, as the Alta Rebbe writes very strongly in Tanya, this person did good to me because they were God's messenger. And this was God's me message. So as God's messenger of God's message, it was only a good message. It's only God. And therefore it was good. And Why therefore do I can forgive. Why do you need to forgive if you know it's all good and it's God's messenger instead of being thankful? Why do you need to forgive if because you understand? If you're, all because this? if you're in pain and you got hurt, if you didn't get hurt and you right away processed it as good, then there's nothing to forgive because you didn't get hurt. But if you're human and got hurt and then you philosophized on it, if someone hurts a Jew, they, they're in trouble. We're, Jews are very precious to God. So if someone hurts another Jew, a Jew or a non-Jew hurts a Jew, they're going to suffer because they hurt a Jew, even though it was part of God's plan and they made bad choices. But that's a separate story. So the fact that I got hurt means the other person has a problem because they hurt me. Because I'm a Jew, I'm very precious. I'm God's child. I'm God's only child. So if someone hurts me, they're going to get in trouble. But if I say... They didn't hurt me, actually. They gave me, remember, like Joseph's metaphor. They thought they were giving me poison, but they gave me wine. How do I know they gave me wine? Because it's from God, and God only gives me wine. So I, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, for, I'm, I'm thankful. I totally forgive them for the pain I felt when I misinterpreted it and thought it was poison and for, didn't realize it was actually wine. So that's why there'd be the forgiveness element if you suffered. If you are on a higher spiritual level, then you're right, there wouldn't be a suffering because you would say, it wasn't my script, but God's script is always better than my script. So thank you for being God's messenger. Thank you for sticking out your foot and me tripping because that's what God wanted to happen. So thank you for being God's messenger. And then you could sit and say what Bella said, and I'm so grateful because I could have broken all my bones, but I only fell on my face and broke my glasses and my nose. So thank you so much for not only being God's messenger, but being such a kind messenger to make sure that the rest of my body is intact. So yes, if you right away think that, there's no concept of forgiveness, you weren't hurt. You just get it for what it is, God's good. But if, you're, if you forgot and you were a little human and you got hurt, then you can forgive them recognizing they're God's messengers of good. No, this wasn't good. Of course it was good. It was God. God's only good. So whoever is giving you this cup, even if they think it's poison, it's always wine because God only gives me wine. God never gives me poison. Okay, so we're over time and we didn't get we're to where I thought we were going to get, but I'm really glad we had this discussion because... It's a very human experience to need to forgive, to get hurt and to realize that you should forgive. And I think a lot of the things that came out and were suggested and were discussed are all great techniques. Everyone works for a certain person in a certain situation. Put them all in your toolbox, in your, your case of where you're gonna be able to open up and think and like, I'm going to try compassion. That didn't work. I'm going to try to think how good they are in general. That didn't work. I'm going to think of how much I gained from this situation. Maybe that worked a little. I'm going to diminish it and realize in two years, I'll forget about it. Perhaps I'm going to understand it was only God and God only does good. So this person was doing good. I'm going to understand that they need my forgiveness because I don't want them to suffer because of me. And I'm going to understand how powerful forgiveness is and how 
conversely horrible it is if someone hurts someone and they didn't forgive because we, we, we keep forgiving for things of past lifetimes. It's that important. And between everything you know, it will happen. And if it doesn't happen today, you're going to remember what Rifka said. You're going to give it more time. You're going to revisit it. You're going to have grown a bit more. You're going to have more perspectives. And you'll try again. And, and God willing, we will all be able to release all that pain because we will have real, real forgiveness for anybody in our world that needs it. Thank you so much. To be continued. Have a great week. Thank you. You too. Thank you.